Very excited to be here, and uh, I hope you've had a good start to the dialogue. Um, let's jump straight into the topic of the night, this after hours discussion on women in foreign and security policy. Uh, I'm going to very briefly introduce the session and then ask each panelist to speak for about five minutes. And this conversation is in an informal setting. Uh, there'll be drinks served, I believe. Um, and the idea is to basically get a conversation going on, uh, on the topic from these panelists here who come from different parts of the world and will be able to share individual experiences of women in the foreign and security policy field. So women, um, so foreign policy and security making is still a man's world. It's men who are mostly diplomats, politicians, leaders of think tanks and uh, academia. So the question, the key question basically is, why do we need more women in foreign policy, in politics, in security? This raises two key questions. Why are they underrepresented to begin with? And what can we do to bridge this gap between a political rhetoric that recognizes that we need women and a clear gap in reality? To begin with, I'll be asking, uh, let's go from uh, left to right. And if I could begin with um, Lily, Deputy Director of, of uh, Kikir, a think tank in China. Um, Lily is, uh, works on South Asia. She began working on Middle East. Now she works on South Asia. And uh, she actually has a PhD from JNU. So it's a pleasure to have her here again in India. And please. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. <laughs> uh, it's an honor uh, for me to be here. Uh, actually, I'm not an expert on gender issue. I'm only an, uh, you know, a scholar on uh, international relations. So today, I uh, only uh, would like to uh, share with you my uh, uh, ideas, uh, you know, based my uh, based on my uh, personal experiences. Uh, I would like to share with you, uh, you know, on the following uh, three points. The first one, um, uh, when I. Uh, uh, got this uh, topic, I really wonder if we have more women uh, in the sector or, for example, is, uh, we have the uh, equal proportion, any uh, really, uh, any real difference it will be? Actually, I don't think so because I, I think uh, for the women, uh, I think we're in this field, uh, I think we are uh, not less professional, not less, uh, you know, rational, uh, not less dedication. So my point is that if uh, there are more women, we will, uh, you know, do uh, as uh, hard as the men uh, do. And we also, I think, uh, you know, we will make choice, uh, you know, uh, based on the uh, uh, national interest, uh, rule of law, uh, or code of the conduct. So the, that's my first point. My second point is that in terms of the decision uh, making, uh, what's the re, uh, big difference between uh, men uh, and m women? I think uh, personally, uh, you know, I think uh, for, uh, for, for myself, I think the disadvantages uh, may be uh, in uh, two uh, aspects. The first one, you know, sometimes it's a little bit emotional. You know, when uh, we face some conflict or war, I think, uh, you know, it's really uh, suffer for myself. Uh, the second one, uh, I think uh, it is the limits of knowledge. For example, uh, I don't have uh, much uh, interest uh, in the military uh, issues. Maybe it will affect, uh, you know, my, uh, uh, job, uh, but I really have the advantage. I think maybe uh, the patients. I think uh, for women, we are good at communication. 
is uh, really, uh, I think, advantage, especially uh, in the foreign uh, relations. Uh, the third point I would like um, to share with you is that I think it's very uh, uh, special, maybe uh, in China. Uh, the question is, is there really any uh, discrimination, you know, uh, because I think in China, uh, the, uh, the ground reality may be uh, different from the uh, Western countries. For, uh, for example, you know, for the Chinese women, uh, uh, we have the continuous uh, employment uh, but uh, maybe uh, in uh, the Western society, for the women, the, uh, you have the uh, faced employment. That means sometimes if uh, you uh, uh, have to give birth to uh, children, you have to uh, you know, stay at home, uh, but uh, for, uh, uh, or just leave the job. Uh, but uh, for China, we will keep the seat for the women, and when you, uh, you know, f uh, finish this uh, special period, you will come back uh, to the job. So that's the problem is for the boss. You know, if the boss have, for example, you know, in my uh, division, uh, you know, we, uh, f uh, we have uh, 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 16 uh, uh, people. Uh, if uh, three of the, uh, them, uh, for example, the, the young ladies, they have to uh, you know, leave, uh, leave the job because of the, uh, you know, their personal reasons. Uh, that means that the uh, left uh, uh, 13s will have to take care of the job. So sometimes for the boss, uh, th they will not really like to hide the women. So I think it's not because of the uh, really discrimination from the men. It's because of the system. So I just uh, want to share with you. So uh, finally, uh, I would, um, you know, yeah, what's the solution uh, for uh, uh, for the problem? Uh, because I I don't uh, I don't really uh, see that there is a, a big problem uh, back home uh, in China. So I can only say that. Uh, uh, we have more uh, equal uh, opportunities and also uh, for the uh, self-awareness uh, of the women by ourselves. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Lily, thank you so much. You've raised a bunch of topics or themes uh, that we talk about or we consider when we talk about women in any uh, workspace. Uh, one which is in terms of different traits that we tend to associate with men and with women. You raised the point about emotional e quotient and you raised the point about self-knowledge and how that can come in handy depending on the areas that uh, women work in. You also raised a really key point about women in the workspace and to center the discussion again uh, in the foreign policy and security field I believe uh, that you yourself work on what so many people tend to consider as hard foreign policy um, uh, themes, such as China's foreign policy, uh, Middle East you've worked on. <coughs> so perhaps if you could share maybe uh, how it has been in your think tank, in the think tank space, if you're specifically or generally in China, if there are, you know, are do you find women in uh, talking about uh, security or hardcore foreign policy issues? How are they taken in um, among the broader people uh, in terms of are they listened to? Do you feel there's a difference in how women academics or think tankers are treated uh, in, uh, in the foreign policy and security debates whenever? Yeah. You need uh, to answer your question? Uh, I mean, if you would like to. But uh, th this is a uh, I later. I should. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Great. So this is, I think, what we can I sort of get back to about uh, women in workspaces, specifically in foreign um, policy institutions and security think tanks uh, in the space that we're talking about here. All right, now we move on to Estonia. We have uh, Rina, uh, who is a research fellow from the International Center for Defense and Security. And uh, Rina works on the Baltic area. 
She has over 20 years of experience in the foreign policy slash defense and security uh, area. Uh, Rina, please. Thank you very much. And I'm very honored to be in this very distinguished panel. Uh, I also have to say that uh, that women's issues and security is, is not really my, my topic, but, but I, I understand that this is a problem. And also in Estonia, and indeed I have been working uh, in this area for more than 20 years, because as uh, the Soviet Union collapsed, I was 18 years old, and, uh, and I got my first job at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs at the age of 18. And uh, since then, I've, I've been working at the MFA and, and the Ministry of Defense, and also now I'm working at the security and defense-related think tank. Um, so Estonia uh, is a very small country. It's, it's only 1.3 million people. And uh, we like to think of ourselves as, as very efficient and, and very modern. And, uh, and I think that we, we also are uh, efficient and modern, uh, but, but not in all fields. And, um, and gender equality is one of them. I'm, I'm not saying that, uh, that Estonia has terrible problems in, in this area, but, but still, if you think that we have no sort of historical or cultural or religious restrictions for women to participate in social life or, or working life, um, uh, and, uh, and actually, I mean, all, yeah, all the people in Estonia have the same access to their education, uh, then uh, I, I would say that we still see a very few women reaching to top political positions and also reaching the top uh, sort of defense or security related uh, positions. And uh, it is very easy to become a diplomat, but it's much more difficult to become an ambassador. Or, uh, for example, 60% uh, of the personnel in the Ministry of Defense are uh, female. But when you come up to, to the heads or department head level, or, for example, the Secretary General or, um, or some other top position, then, then you hardly ever see any, any woman uh, in that position. And, um, and I would also say that when it comes to, for example, military service, the Estonian uh, defense is based on the conscript army. Uh, and until now, uh, we have only recruited boys, but, but now there are debates going on as the recruitment ground is, is narrowing down. And uh, because of demographic changes and, and, uh, and problems, then uh, there is an issue of of why shouldn't we start recruiting uh, girls as well? <coughs> and uh, in this question, I would uh, point out maybe there are two reasons. And um, one of the reasons is certainly that, that um, the women do not want to take too much responsibility uh, at the workplace because they also have responsibility at home. But uh, today, I think that, uh, in a way, it is an artificial problem in Estonia, as we have a very supportive social system that <coughs> allows mothers to stay at home for one and a half years, uh, full pay. Uh, and if she wants, she can also work at the same time. Um, but the problem is, is something else, and I think that this is uh, maybe part of the Soviet legacy, because during the Soviet times, I mean, women and, and men were equal in the sense that, uh, that people were working people. We did not talk about women, and we did not talk about men separately. And uh, th for women, it often meant uh, a double burden, both at work and uh, at home, and uh, in many cases, women worked um, or had two jobs to, uh, to get the ends come together. And uh, when Estonia regained its independence in the beginning of the 90s, then, uh, then actually this opportunity to feel yourself as a woman and stay at home with a kid 
felt like a privilege and uh, an advantage and many women took that opportunity so they voluntarily stepped back from the working life and they they enjoyed their time at home with the kids because this this had never happened before to to women and this was seen as a privilege but now as the societies are developing very fast and, and our life is developing very fast and uh, and uh, and we need more sort of very well educated workforce then of course Estonian women have also come back to the to the labor market and uh, they are again very efficiently sort of uh, taking care of homes and uh, and also their work um, tasks and um, for example women are willing to do much more than <coughs> they are given the opportunities to do and uh, one of um, uh, especially when it comes to military, for example, that many women would voluntarily like to join the army, but uh, many of the women who join the army drop out after some time because because of the sort of conventional attitudes of, of men in the army who say that this is not the place for women. So w w if you cannot take hard chokes, if you cannot take or fulfill these physical norms, then it, it's a proof that you, you don't belong here. So very often I think that uh, what is wrong is that women have to prove themselves for the men and not for the organizations or for the state they could benefit. So I will stop here. Thank you so much. And um, from what uh, you've just said, we've basically, um, come, we've basically come across another aspect when it comes to gender uh, and gender and work, basically. Gender, integrating uh, uh, representation, uh, um, uh, integrating women into jobs and employment, whether it's military and defense or otherwise. And that is of the institutional architecture that exists in a country, the public services, the, the, the social uh, environment in which women and men are uh, raised. Uh, you raised the point that uh, education, for instance, is not so much an issue because access to education is more equitable in Estonia than it is in uh, large parts of uh, uh, other large parts of the world. Uh, so that's, I think, is an, another issue that we can maybe come back to, um, basically the, uh, the context in which we are, we grow up and we learn, and what that means when we actually come to working, because then do attitudes still come into play then and there, or does education actually help us reform what we think? Uh, now we're going to come to uh, Tanzania, and we have Ms. Lucy, Lucy Schuel. Uh, she is a lecturer and director of studies at the National Defense College, um, and please take it away. Thank you, Chair. It's my pleasure to be part of this panel, important panel. I will share our, my interventions by providing the Africa's experience and sometimes drawing examples from Tanzania and other countries in Africa. The moderator posed three questions. The first one, why do we need more women? My immediate answer, I could say, because we are the majority in most of the cases. If we look into the uh, statistics for most of the countries, uh, the variation is quite minor, especially in African countries, can be between uh, 0 0.5 up to 2 in terms of population distribution between men and women. So my immediate answer would say uh, we need more women because of those uh, minor differences in terms of population distribution to some of the, to most of the African countries for that matter. <coughs> And also, we need women because in foreign policy, security affairs, like in the other fields, they have not been participating and there have been some perception. Maybe if they are engaged in a broader 
perspective, then uh, they could make change. They could get an opportunity to make change, but uh, that uh, has not been uh, realized. This and the representation of women in uh, foreign policy and security issues, I could say, uh, in the context of Africa, is um, can be reflected in two aspects. The first one is the whole question of nation building because, for example, foreign policy security issues have been taken to be the preside. For example, the executive has been leading and other institutions like the parliament and others, they just uh, come in in the process. So the emphasis, for example, since has been to increase the number, but now to what degree those women contribute is also important because uh, the way I see it, yes, we can have more, but do they make impact in the same system which has been created by patriarchy or by that perspective which will continue to make uh, uh, men's domination in those fields? And also, underrepresentation can be reflected in the way we perceive, for example, security affairs. Most uh, people uh, reflect security from the hard security, state security perspective. But if we, we are to look into how gender relations are translated into, relation, into the society, we could see that uh, it's not just the state security. When we talk about peace, for example, a state can be peaceful but uh, women are continuing to suffer within that peaceful uh, society. So there's a need to look into security from the human perspective, which can give us a clear picture on how um, both men and women are engaged in those um, affairs. Um, the last... Uh, intervention that you could make is what needs to be done. Most of the focus has been, uh, for example, to say, maybe we should we engage men in these discussions. But for the Africa's uh, perspective, there are also variations in terms of cultural differences and backgrounds, whereby, uh, for example, uh, FGM, female genital mutilation, can be, is, is bad in itself, but some societies perceive that in order to be respected, one needs to be, to undergo through FGM. So those variations need to, to include all women in those, to have a clear understanding of what uh, the goal that to, uh, the society wants to achieve. So is not just to include men, but also to include other women who have not been uh, perceiving those differences in terms of gender as part of the process. Thank you. Thank you. And if you notice, um, um, you brought out two really interesting points. One is the sort of moral imperative, because as you've mentioned, <coughs> women, demographically, there are more women now in some countries, and that needs to be adequately represented in all parts of um, decision making. And at the same time, there is also a rationale that isn't just moral, but maybe also strategic in a sense, in terms of, for instance, when you mentioned that security, how do we understand it? Men and women perceive it differently, and they're differently affected by it. And it's not just a matter of maybe war and tanks and machine guns, but it's also about, in peacetime, um, access to water, and that also impacts human security as, as, as a whole. And that's, I think, another avenue that we can maybe pursue in the, the question and answer round. And now we will take a trip to Tunisia, and uh, we have with us uh, Huda Sharif. She is currently president of a civil society organization, Connecting Group Tunisia, uh, Connecting Group, apologies. Previously, uh, Ms. Uh, Huda Sharif has worked in politics. Uh, she was one of the founding members of a um, of, of Afek Tunis, a political party that was started uh, during just after the Arab Spring. Um, and Ms. Huda, please. 
Thank you very much. I'm also, it's not really my topic. <laughs> so I, I actually, based on, on some of the, um, uh, the question, driving questions, I set a speech that I'm gonna read actually, and you, you can interact afterwards with, with this speech. So ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It is an honor and a privilege for me to participate for the first time in this international conference which looks after managing disruptive transitions. I would like to warmly thank the ORA for inviting me to contribute to this panel <coughs> on a complex and obviously a topical issue, namely women in diplomatic and security policy. I personally link everything to politics. So whatever it is, like diplomatic, uh, uh, <coughs> diplomatic and security remains part of the choice of politicians and politics. So that's why, um, I'm going to give my thoughts uh, on the role of women in designing public policies and her contribution in preventing conflicts and maintaining stability as a prerequisite condition to achieving democracy. And here we are talking also about uh, managing dis disruptive transitions. My contribution will therefore reflect my experience as a woman politician, founder of a party, and gender activist within a country that is now passing by a transitional phase that is characterized by diverse contradictions. I will try to highlight what the international and national community needs to do to help women gain more power. As you know, I come from Tunisia, which initiated in 2011 what many people call the Arab Spring. I don't like this word. <laughs> women were involved with every step of this movement. She couldn't stand, uh, stand up with dictatorship, marginalization, so she, hand in hand with men, went out to the streets, mm -hmm. shouting and bouting. She wrote and shook and confused with her pen. She embarrassed with her art. She impressed with her brave positions. Tunisian, tu Tunisian women have, as a matter of fact, participated very actively in all forms of expressions <coughs> during and after the January 14th events, from sit-ins to strikes to neighborhood watch committee to social networks. They shouted their objection to the first draft of a new constitution while being drafted because it pointed to women as partner of men. I quote article 28 that say the state ensures the protection of women women's rights and the consolidation of the acquisition of women as a true partner of men in building the nation and as sharing a complementary role within the family. Women <coughs> protested against women in Tunisia, protested against being described as partner, which means not equal, and complementary, and so in that a breach of their citizenship. They went on a massive march to express their refusal to the Constitution article and called for its reformulation, and they won the case. Starting from, so you'll see why I'm talking about all of this, because we will end up in the same position. I mean, starting from that point, we can say that the street has become the space, not to say the battlefield, so that's the space for women, the battlefield for women to express their worries and talk about their aspirations. One of the most important achievements of the post-revolution period was the lifting of the remaining reserve held by Tunisia over Sidao. The next important achievement of the post-revolution period was the introduction of gender alternating parity as a major component of electoral law. So no lists without like men, women, or men, or women, men, women, men. It's, 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 it's like um, obligation to accept the list. Uh, of course, um, not to mention the CSP, the Code de Statut Personnel, the backbone of women's rights legislation in Tunisia, which since 1956 came out with the revolutionary laws that protected women and aim it at the institution of equality between women and men in a number of areas, so vote, election, wages, divorce, outlawed, they are, it outlawed also polygamy. So despite all of this, we still don't see enough women in leadership position in Tunisia. And this is, I should say, is not only specific to Tunisia, I have to admit, and that's why I think we are all here together, uh, gathered today. I believe that women participation in decision making is not necessarily related to legal texts. 
In fact, there is often a big gap between texts and reality. The social reality of Tunisian women today is pulling her back and putting a break to her participation and her involvement in public life. The outcome, for example, of the parliamentary elections recently, despite the adoption of the parity law, uh, we have out of 217 members of parliament, only 27 of them are women. And you might say, that's okay. No, that's not okay. We want to be real, I mean, like to share uh, the decision making with, with men. Uh, also, out of 43 members of government, we have <coughs> only three ministers, women, and three secretary of state, which means six women in 43 men, which is still very much low. This is so a concrete evidence of the big gap between the official texts and the implementation of those texts in real life. So we are lucky, I mean, I'm gonna say it somewhere here, uh, uh, I mean, among, in the Arab world, we all, decide, we, all, we all the time say that Tunisian women are very lucky uh, in terms of rights. Yes, we are lucky, but on papers, and we want them to be, uh, I mean, we want to see this on, uh, on the field. Um, so I would like to stress on the fact that it is not enough to work on legislating and introducing values and ideas in new constitution, either for all other countries, the most important thing is to be able to put them into practice through working on changing mindsets. That's the problem, actually. Attitudes. Finding out the causes behind those attitudes and trying to avoid them. So that is, of course, not particular uh, to Tunisia. There is a lot to do with women who, in many cases, and out of cultural formatting, I would say, like we put them in a kind of, and we are formatage, and we are formatting, uh, tend to privilege and give the space to men. Like in, in the States, and here we have like Cheryl, uh, there's the bestseller of Cheryl Sandberg, Lean In, and she, she digs deep into gender inequality in this, in this bestseller, and uh, under representation of women as a valuable part of the global workforce, and that's why we, women, you ask the question, why do? Because we are uh, a valuable part of the global workforce. Um, it shows, uh, so this book shows how, uh, how they themselves, women, unintentionally hold themselves back. Uh, so again, we cannot just mandate and legislate our way to gender equality. We have to substantially change our attitudes and behavior, both men and women. In fact, among the challenges faced by women candidates during campaigning, for example, this is to give you an example, uh, during campaigning for the legislative election in Tunisia, we can state challenges of two sorts, of two levels, social and cultural challenges of, a, of, a, of a social and cultural natures, and other challenges of a contextual natures. So, as far as the cultural and social uh, related challenges are concerned, we can find social attitudes and prejudiced ideas regarding women and political leadership. They would tell you women can't lead. They are not made for that. If you go on like in the street and ask and go for a, for a kind of um, um, uh, questionnaire or uh, they would, uh, yeah, uh, survey, they would go, uh, I mean, no, it's, it's, it's not, she, she's not made for that. Uh, also, also there's the, the challenge of control over women's private life and mobility. Uh, the, the, their parents, their, her, her father, her bigger brother would like, no, you can't campaign by night, by the end of, I mean, uh, that's of course in the regions. I'm not talking the, about the, the, the cities, but in regions, she would. She has this control over her private life. Um, Ms. Sharif, <coughs> if you could quickly then, you can. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Uh, the way uh, <coughs> roles and responsibility are being also shared within the family, a lot of burden on women, which makes her really not able to um, to 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 go for public uh, activities and public life. Um, for uh, also let. Um, uh, on the contextual, uh, so I will go to contextual challenges. We have we had low media coverage for um, for women candidates. 
uh, only two to four percent of space in newspaper, for example, magazines uh, and media in in general was reserved to women candidates in Tunisia in 2011 legislative elections and the total absence of adequate strategies and clear mechanism to encourage the participation of women within the political parties and themselves so we have like underrepresentation uh, even in within the parties themselves okay. um, yeah. I'm gonna ask you to stop yeah, here and then course. we'll yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, carry on uh, conversation later uh, now we'll quickly move on to uh, Ms. Rachel Rizzo. She's a research associate at the Transatlantic Security Program <laughs> um, at the Center for a New American uh, Security. And uh, please share your thoughts. Thank you. Uh, so I work at a small DC-based think tank. Um, we're bipartisan, about 40 people, co-founded by a woman and run by a woman, interesting fact. Um, and while I mostly focus on European security, my colleagues and I over the last year have focused on a project working on uh, representation of women in the national security space in the United States. Um, we've hosted roundtables, we've hosted media trainings, and we've done dozens and dozens of podcasts with women ranging from interns all the way up to military leaders and senior executive service in the government. And we've come across really, really interesting things, but I'll just touch on um, a couple of them. The first is that, um, as we've heard from uh, my colleagues speak today, underrepresentation of women is still an issue. And it's surprising to hear because um, sometimes, you know, when we started doing this project, um, I got a call from someone that said, you know, I saw that you're doing a project on women in national security. Isn't this taken care of? I mean, is this really an issue anymore? And the answer is yes, yes it is. Um, even though women are graduating at the same rates and even sometimes at higher rates from the top policy schools around the world, um, as you get further and further up the ladder, fewer and fewer women are represented at the top. Um, and there are many, many reasons for this, but I'll just highlight a, a couple. Um, the first is that, and one of uh, my colleagues mentioned this earlier, women, especially if they have familial obligations, oftentimes have to choose between working late hours and you know family. So in the government, hours are notoriously grueling, sometimes 14 hours a day, seven days a week. And so when the, deci when the decision has to be made between going and picking up you know, a child from daycare or school and staying late to wait for that classified document coming across the high side and getting extra face time with your boss, you can't leave your kids sitting at school. So you know, your colleague maybe is going to get more promotional um, opportunities out of that. The second is that there's a weird sort of self-selection thing that happens. You know, if a woman is looking at a position and the requirements, and she looks at it and says, well, you know, I only have seven out of the 10 requirements for this position. I'm not even going to go for it. Whereas a man, no offense to any of the men in the room, might look at it and say, I've got seven out of the 10 requirements here. I'm good. They've got, they've got to hire me. So we have that kind of um, weird sort of self-bias sometimes. Um, the third thing that we've noticed is that men need to be a part of this conversation. Sometimes when you bring up women's issues, um, it's women talking to women. And we tried to fix that last year at our, um, at our um, annual <coughs> conference where we hosted an intentional manal, an intentional all-male panel. And we hosted it at 9 o'clock in the morning right before the Vice President of the United States spoke. So we thought, you know, people are wanna, gonna wanna get there early and get a good seat for Vice President Biden. We're gonna put the women in national security panel right at the beginning and everyone's gonna have to listen to it. So we kind of pulled a fast one, but it was really, it was really interesting the kind of feedback that we got. But some of the ideas that we've come up with for men um, in this space is to sponsor junior women. Find young, promising women in this space, sponsor them, mentor them, and hire them, and help them become leaders in this field. And the last one I would say, um, and this is my favorite, you know, many people in this room get um, media opportunities, and sometimes you get too many. So as a man, if you get a TV hit that you don't want to do, if you get um, asked to publish a piece that you don't want to publish, give the names of five women who instead could take that media hit or uh, do that publication instead. So make women part of the conversation, make men part of the conversation, and let's you know fi fix it together. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Rachel, and thank you for raising the issue of men in this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, now uh, we'll uh, come to our last speaker, Miss um, Bikim Sao. Uh, Miss uh, Sao is a senior advisor at the Prospect Foundation Taiwan. Um, and please. Thank you. 
Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, I had prepared some remarks in more general terms. But I was asked by the moderator. I think we all, we're all asked by the moderator to <laughs> talk in some personal terms as well. So I want to say that uh, being here is the first time in uh, several uh, ways for me. Um, first of all, of the maybe a couple hundred international conferences and events I've attended in my lifetime, this is the first time there is a foreign or security policy related event that is devoted to women, uh, the role of women. Um, and uh, secondly, well, it's the first time attending a panel at this hour of night, <laughs> uh, especially with jet lag. Um, and so I'm not in my most articulate state at the moment, so please uh, pardon me if I'm not as clear as I would hope to be. But uh, um, I want to first start with a simple mental exercise, because um, if, if we can turn off all the sound bites and just look at this panel, you know, the, the picture of this panel up here, and pretend we don't know the topic of discussion here, um, what would most people think this panel is talking about? You, you might think this is a panel about education, about family issues, about alleviating poverty, or maybe even about the environment or health care. Um, but I think very few people, I mean, it's all logical to think about these areas of concern for women, but fewer people would imagine this image of a panel to be talking about uh, hard power and security issues. Uh, we wouldn't be talking about <laughs> trying to avert a nuclear disaster or trying to fight terrorism with a panel that looks like this. But I think it's very important and it's a positive step that uh, this particular dialogue is devoting a session or two to the role of women. And I think it's a good beginning. And I also have a, a, a belief that eventually the concept of gender mainstreaming will reach uh, national security and foreign policy areas. Um, but I want to say that still, uh, for centuries, diplomacy has been a highly gendered man's job because it implies an outward social uh, skills and the ability to travel distant lands um, and sometimes unknown lands too. Uh, it also uh, requires a demonstration of national power and strength. And uh, security, especially as it is linked to military uh, position, has even been much, has been so much more uh, exclusive of uh, women's participation historically. And this crosses all different cultural boundaries. And I think it's uh, something that we can all agree on. Um, and international relations have highlighted characteristics of independence, strength, aggression, and the willingness to use force. And these are not characteristics traditionally associated with the female gender. And that is perhaps a reason these stereotypes and prejudices um, that exist in international relations, why women have been so much excluded over centuries. Um, but of course, recently, we have seen some changes. You know, around the world, we are seeing more women as heads of states, as ministers, ambassadors, as parliamentarians. This is certainly a change. Even in my own country of Taiwan, we just last year, we elected a woman president and commander in chief. And uh, in parliament, we are nearly 40% uh, women representation. And uh, I think this is, it has been difficult, especially in the Asian context, for a woman to reach political prominence, uh, especially if she is not from a family of blood relations to a previous political, a male leader who had already established political prominence. And uh, so I believe we've come a long way and we've broken many glass ceilings around the world, not only in my country, but in many places around the world. And certainly there are more, more role models uh, to inspire many more younger people of, diff of new generations. But um, as I said, things are changing. I think still it's really not enough. Um, and um, as we are growing more accustomed to seeing women's faces in leadership roles, uh, at the same time, we have to ask, does it make a difference for women on other levels um, in the roles that they also play in international relations? Because it's not just a proactive role. In many, uh, in many circumstances, women are victims. They are victims of violence. They are migrant workers with specific gender-related issues. Um, they also could be um, 
uh, victims of economic mismanagement. Uh, so there are many roles of women in the international system. Women are also consumers. They are also creators of, of technologies or innovations uh, in how to improve uh, the distribution of resources in the global setting. And so I think it, uh, in addition to having more women in top leadership positions, we need more women on all levels of international involvement. And sometimes it is useful to include those women uh, who are not necessarily leaders, but they have very valid experiences uh, of what social or what human security actually means. But I, I want to add a third point, and that is, uh, as we've been also addressing uh, what the role of men should be, could, could possibly be in improving the status of women uh, in international uh, foreign policy and security policy, and that is, you know, I think our goal is not just to have women in these positions, but feminists. And I talk about feminists as also in the context of men who can also be feminists. And I refer to fem feminism as implying a willingness to challenge uh, structures of power or systems of power. And the current state of international relations, or, ha or the way it has been in decades, is that uh, international relations are based on the interaction of nation states. And the strength of nation states, as we heard in the earlier presentation uh, by Prime Minister Netanyahu, is number one, military, number two, economics. Um, and that is what we traditionally see as hard power. But I want to say that in a changing society, especially if we are willing to deconstruct the existing power structures, we have to add other dimensions of power. And these might include what we commonly know as soft power or other values, um, other roles of women and contributions that non-state actors can make in the international system. And so this conference in general, not just this session, I know has a theme about disruption. And uh, I, I know it's not realistic to expect the international system um, as it is at the moment a nation state based system that still focuses on military and economic strength. It's not realistic to expect a full deconstruction of that and we're not after all revolutionaries but I think we, what we can do is to expect a gradual increase of other dimensions in the international system and a strengthened role for uh, non-state actors uh, and the spirit of inclusiveness and universality um, because I believe uh, there are many more opportunities, especially with the democratization of information and the tools available for disseminating information, uh, the universality of education, et cetera, that provide many more women and those who are not necessarily uh, in the nation state based international system to take part in the international system. And so I want to end there with these three points. That is, yes, we have women in leadership positions, they are in national security positions, but there's simply not enough. And um, I think we can all recognize that, um, w yeah. you know, if, if you take the gender equality index that exists, a UNDP indication or index with some other global peace index, and I know there are some think tanks that are, are, are building these various indicators, and you put the two lists together, you will find that countries that are more, have a higher degree of gender equality are also countries that tend to be more peaceful, not only between each other, but also within, within those countries. And so if we can agree that this is the state of relations and it is a goal, then I think we should also be placing women or involving women on various different levels of international relations and also uh, trying to diversify uh, the current definition of what diplomacy means uh, by uh, including many more non-state actors in the process. I felt like that was a very rousing and fitting end to these interventions. And thank you so much for bringing the point about the broader political economy um, of gender basically in different levels, not just specifically think tanks and foreign policy and security and government and politics. And now we have about 10 minutes.
and I'd like to open the floor up uh, for questions. Uh, so please, yes. And sorry, we'll take maybe a couple and then have the panel respond. I was gonna make a comment. Comments, more than welcome. Okay. First of all, let me applaud ORF and Racing the Dialogue in particular and this panel because I'm just so pleased to see this. I have to say I haven't seen this in the United States. People think the United States is so progressive. I've never seen this and I hope to see it more. And I wanted to just um, dovetail on some of the things that Rachel said because I also come from the U.S. and say that in the U.S. it's not about relegating women's positions to the home anymore. Uh, a lot of times women are not making it to the leadership positions either because they are not making themselves available 24 hours in the way that Rachel described uh, and that is not being compared to their actual output. There are many, uh, uh, many instances in which the output of a woman is much higher than a man who is much more available than she may be. Oh, somebody didn't like that. Um, <laughs> And the other thing is, oftentimes in the States, women are disqualified not because of their gender, because they're not fit to be in the place, but rather because uh, of personal attacks. She is a, you know, she is a bitch, pardon my opinion. Because oftentimes the way for a woman, a woman to progress in a male-dominated field is to affect a male way of aggressiveness, uh, to take on this sort of persona. And, uh, and then that's sort of frowned upon. And what I want to say is that I'm looking for a time that first of all, we can change the uh, work time frame. That working is not necessarily nine to five. It's about output. It's about getting the job done. We have smartphones, we have internet. Uh, business deals are being made on Asia time, on Eastern Standard Time. They're being made on Skype and FaceTime. And taking into account basically getting the job done and not exactly when it's gotten done or where it's gotten done. But also embracing the role of the woman uh, mother worker. I'm a mother. I'm a worker. I have career ambitions. I want to be a certain type of mother to my children. I want to be available. I don't want it held against me. In fact, I think that I should be lauded for trying to balance those two things. I personally am a little bit more of a subscriber to the Anne Marie Slaughter School of Thought than the Sheryl Sandberg School of Thought, but I'm glad that they're both out there. And I think that we have to find a way to put women in leadership positions, to change the work dynamic, and to promote those dual roles rather than make it a either or. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do we have another one? Yes. Please. Hi. Thank you so much for uh, all of the speak to all of the speakers. I have uh, one comment and one question. Uh, the first one is around the question of women are affected differently by conflict. Of course they are. I mean, the most stark example is gender-based violence. Do we need more women in foreign and security? Uh, of course we do. Also in police and military, this completely changes the way that uh, foreign or international forces and police are perceived and can be approached by women in foreign countries. Um, and one question, even if we have seen that even if we have equal numbers, which as we have heard is not always the case, but even if we, even if we have equal numbers in leadership positions, within, uh, let's say, management, uh, top management discussions, women tend to not speak up and not take part in the discussion as much as they are equal peers. Mm -hmm. Now, we can argue that oh, the women should lean in and speak up more, and that's part of the conversation, but is that really the way we want to go? Because there is something to be said to, uh, for a room that's not just everybody sh shouting over each other, but having maybe a more reflected or just a different type of conversation, and not putting the onus only on the women that they then have to lean in, so to say. Thank you. Um, yes, please. Um, I believe I had seen a, yes, go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry, I also have a comment, but I'll make sure. it brief. Sharon Squasani, I'm from the U.S. You might have noticed we've been having a big discussion or scandal in the U.S. recently about women and everything else. Um, network, network, network. 
Uh, the best thing that happened last year was Anna Fifield, a very well-known journalist, said, why, do we, why don't we have, hear more women's voices on North Korea and their nukes? And she sent around a, uh, not only did we tweet and put photos on Facebook of all the mantles, all the panels that are only men, right? But she started uh, gathering names, a list of 50 women not just Americans, but all over the world, who are experts on North Korea, and she, some of them are, are here, she sent it around to not only the think tanks, but also uh, editors, journalists. So uh, we have the technology. Let's use it. Thank you. Um, yeah, yes, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, just to say uh, thank you for all the speeches. Um, just to draw your attention that nobody talks about women entrepreneurs and women in business, and they I can. I believe that's a panel that's coming up tomorrow. Okay. On broader. Yeah, no, women but in but they could oh. have a big role when it comes to to be an actor for uh, security and. Um, uh, problem uh, issues of uh, political and uh, security issues. So uh, it's, uh, it's important to highlight the role of women entrepreneurs creating jobs and uh, facing uh, these this kind of issues. Very well caught. Um, th th thank you for the, for the presentation. I was very happy to hear your uh, experiences. Uh, allow me to make a very disruptive remark. Um, these are the same stories that were heard in the 70s in actually all over the world. And so those stories of women have not changed. Now what only, what only has changed is that this is coming from a security or a foreign policy space. Uh, take it to a uh, meeting of uh, social workers, you will get the same stories whether it's in Turkey or the United States. So why are women not learning from each other? Now, if I think about what a man would do, and I don't have an issue with men, believe you me, <laughs> but, and I learned a lot from them, if a man would be in a position that we would be as women, they would have a manual ready. They would understand the dynamics, they would understand the enemy. And the enemy is you, you yourself, and other women. That's the first enemy. And the second enemy is men. And men would have a strategy ready how to deal with everything. So why don't we, as women, after 40 years of women's studies departments all over the world, repeating all these same stories in all the different languages of the world, already for 40 years, why don't we have that manual ready? Um, thank you so much for removing a layer of politically correct language that I think we tend to adopt, especially when we talk about such a sensitive topic such as gender. Uh, any more comments, please? Uh, we'll, 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 we'll take a last round of comments um, before we, I'll ask for, yeah, before we close the session. Yeah, please. Thank you, Ritika. Uh, I have heard voices from all around the world. And I'm here, uh, I work for an Indian think tank, and I work on security policy, policy, hard security. You know, so what I could realize that your problem, my problem are all same. But I would like to say that there is a change. And this change we can see here in India. Right now, two of our important position, foreign minister and our defense ministry are both being headed by two very capable women. So the story, I would say, it's changing, definitely. Also, when it comes to the government position, I would say in 1940, uh, when our first batch of women diplomats were hired, in fact, our first generation of diplomats, some of them were very skilled women starting from Johanna Nehru's uh, sister. They were all very educated women. They proved themselves. And of course, then we have seen Muthamma, the first IFS officer. She had to fight our way out. But th that things has changed. Right now, India has produced four 
foreign secretaries and both of our two very important secretary at the foreign ministry both the secretary west and secretary east are women what i would like to highlight of course when the defense uh, uh, when it comes to security think tank uh, foreign policy issues i uh, initially we used to say that yeah i, I will wrap it up definitely let me tell st share the india story a little bit so there is when ORF, I would try to say the share the story of ORF. Two years back, ORF came up with a sh sharing all the situation that there should be one woman in every panel. There should be must, so gender parity. Now, after two years, we have seen so many beautiful chairs. The women have come up and they are chairing the issues the way. So initially, nobody thought of women chairing a very hard security stuff like uh, uh, problem in Shiachin Glacier. But it happened, it happens. What happens first, so th that showcases two stories. First is giving them opportunity, and women have to work hard to achieve that position. If you can really prove yourself, it, it happens. So first, the space, second, your capability. Thank Both things will work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one last comment, I'm afraid. OK, or two. OK, so please, please keep them as brief as possible. OK, yeah. And then Hi, uh, when Sheryl Sandberg, the CEO from Facebook, is in a panel like this, she noticed the difference between questions between male and female. Males will ask her about her uh, techniques, about how she can perform better. But women ask, like, how do you balance your family life and your working life? So just following on what you said, I would like to know from in the foreign policy area, which questions we as women are not asking and that we should know. Thank you. And uh, last comment, sorry, last comment, please. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jennifer and I'm from Germany. I'm working, um, well, in the field of defense. And I would like to comment back on what you said, that you had major progress in India and that there are uh, women in the major ministry positions. Well, as you might all know, Germany has had a chancellor, um, a female chancellor who has been from the Conservative Party. And I must say, so what? There hasn't been any change under Angela Merkel, and she's an, uh, well, a chancellor of a quite well, wealthy well, influ uh, well, country with influence, and we don't see that this helps women in any way. Right now, we have a parliament that has more men than ever before after almost well, well 14 years of a, of a female chancellor. And so I wonder um, if it doesn't help that a woman gets in the leading position. Of course, we have very few CEOs. What can women really do? I suppose there's more networking. I, I expect men to network more. But then what can we do well, to convince men? Because I always have the, 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 the feeling that you have to work twice as hard and that, that you really have to convince. So what is the point? That what, what, what is there actually to do? All right. Thank you so much. I I see one last very quick 30 second intervention. Okay, please. I saw you agitating. <laughs> Hi, my name is Mary Mordak. I work for the Office of the National Security Council in Afghanistan. Um, I'm curious if there's any type of network or any initiative that you females on the panel are going to take in order to create this <laughs> to move forward. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm sorry. That's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. And I will not like to sum up this panel. I think the idea was to enter into an informal, in a more relaxed environment, a conversation on just what issues, challenges, perspectives women bring um, in their specific careers related to foreign policy and security, specifically broadly politics, development areas from different parts of the world. And we have seen that amply from the panel, but also from the audience. And I think it's been an exciting conversation that has taken place. We've raised lots of issues. I'd just like to end on one thought, and I think this kind of goes back to the idea of men and women and equality and uh, w what needs to happen to make change occur, which, as some of you have raised, is not actually happening in any capacity. Um, I hope that what this discussion has been here has not been, that we, this is not an echo chamber, because we must have noticed that only women spoke here. And if I may say so, um, there weren't, Oh, OK, all right, all right. But the idea that more needs to happen, absolutely. And that more will take different facets and different 
uh, and, and that's going to be brought forward by both men and women. But hopefully these conversations don't end up just reinforcing our own attitudes and beliefs and, and different perspectives that we have from different parts of the world. So I just I, I wish to leave uh, finish this conversation just on that thought that we attempt to not have conversations that reinforce already existing known truths about the space and gender. Thank you. <laughs>